I took the request of having a, a theoretical approach a little bit serious. Um, but I have to admit that I'm also preparing another talk and that um, this is in fact the general rehearsal, partly for a talk which I'm giving next week in uh, the Film Museum in Amsterdam. It's not really true. This is uh, quite different from next week, but I have never spoken before uh, together with text, so it's a bit of an experimental thing. Um, I waited until the age of 49 this year to start writing down my ideas um, on uh, not so much on my work but on what I believe to be seeing uh, as an evolution um, in the image and more particularly in photography. And much of my experience comes from working since five, six years in what I describe as uh, pictorial 3D. It was a logical step for my studio, which is a studio made out of, let's say, 10 to 15 people. Um, at the moment it's 10 people. Uh, we call it a democratic institution with a totalitarian person on the top. That's how the studio looks like. So everybody's an artist, but they're also engineers. They come from different backgrounds and they all do what they are best at. And since f five, six years, actually, uh, maybe even a little bit longer, we've been exploring um, lensless images, um, appearing very much like camera-made images. So we've been exploring the things that usually are more privileged to um, expensive productions, um, but we do everything with low budget, of course, so there's a lot of guerrilla work that's happening in my studio. And I'm starting with the first sentence here, which is a quote of um, the wonderful Roland Barthes. Um, I would like to talk to you about three things, and I will start with the concept of dark optics. Uh, I just realized that actually in almost all of my titles there's a paradox. So dark optics must be the first one. And of course, if uh, Bart speaks about the photographic referent not being just an option uh, to which an image or a sign refers, but the necessarily real thing which once upon a time, once upon a place, was there and authenticated the photographer or the artist to take uh, this image before his lens or her lens, without which there would be no photograph. And similarly to technologies of images, one has to say with sadness, there's a certain redundancy to what Roland Barthes wrote. Um, in the analog era, this of course is very valid, um, but when, um, with the current evolutions, and if we may be so pretentious to guess where the industry of the image is evolving to, um, I would say it's part of history. And I've tried to be brief on my uh, elaboration with dark optics, but to be honest, there's material for three hours of debate on uh, each of the chapters. The first one being dark optics, the second one being digital materiality. It's again another paradox. And the third I will finish with is uh, the anti-anthropocentrism. There's a certain echo of the anti-camera there, but we'll see all about that at the end. I don't have too many images, because I suppose maybe you didn't come for the images. I could, I could, uh, uh, um, I could lull you with a lot of images, but I think maybe we wait with that for a while. So I have to run through this text. We only have another 40 minutes, I believe. Um, and maybe take a moment to realize that analog images were thought to provide mutual authentication between what is in front of the lens and who is behind the camera. This is still, till today, and probably tomorrow as well, the basic religion in which anyone 
believing in automated images has to step into. It's a kind of belief. It's a sort of truth system, uh, which has been with us for at least 160 years. But I think it was uh, the disintegration of the pictorial system that came before photography, namely through painting, was already disintegrating more than a century before the invention of photography. So the announcement of photography lies somewhere 260 to 300 years before that. In fact, if you would uh, think further on how photography was announced, we would, of course, have to go back to the, uh, uh, to the Greek uh, thinkers and, and the effect of uh, light and shadows. The only problem ever was to uh, fix the traces of the light until this one day, I believe it was in 1939, when someone came up with an idea um, to develop out of uh, a problem that this person had with uh, fixing lithography, then developed uh, um, a liquid that could actually um, fix uh, a, a source of light onto uh, a, a surface which then later became polyester or celluloid. It subcontracted a recently lost truth system to a device. Of course, when I speak about the recently lost truth system, I'm speaking about the, the period of um, scientific revolution and then leading towards the invention of photography. The analog era, I pretend a little bit pretentiously, is now closed and lasted roughly 160 years. It transitioned briefly into the digital camera, this is a bit of a shortcut I'm taking there, which still used lenses, moving slowly but certainly into an era where images are no longer dependent on light but born out of the three C's concept, conversation, and consensus. With concept, conversation, and consensus, I effectively mean the creation of images um, as they are taught. Imagine, very, very, uh, to give you an example, imagine um, a Disney animation studio uh, deciding on how to produce the next uh, uh, Jungle Book um, franchise version. And there is 99.9% .9 of the production is discussion, is debate, and in the end ends with consensus. Basically, the way uh, the future of the image works is that there's a lot of thinking involved. And when there's a lot of thinking and discussion involved, there's also a certain consensus involved. Consensus always necessarily means compromise, and compromise means there's a certain reduction of outcome. Um, there is a limitation, and this is why I end my sentence with long de deliberations on vegetation. This is just for as an example. In an image, require a degree in biology in order to be able to settle them properly, but are actually settled with a shortcut, which is Wikipedia or Google or anything that looks similar to the idea that we would actually uh, of which we would like to make a picture out. So the era of dark optics means that we lose mutual authentication. We lose this system of the camera, where, which actually I would say was, if one could say of a technology that it had a political preference, we would say that photography was liberal. It was open to anything. It was open to any light that would enter Go, come through the lens and would graciously descend upon the surface which would then react chemically and be fixated. So there was a, there's a liberal openness to the invention of photography. In dark optics, we lose uh, this uh, system of originality, of having been in front of something. We no longer, to produce an image, require an apparatus, a specific time or a specific place or a film that has a specific speed. Suddenly, and this is a little bit mysterious, I realize this, but I will speak later again about the tableau. The tableau and the relation to the painting sound familiar again. So we actually, with a new debate, 
on dark optics, we go back to the period before the invention of photography. In fact, we return to the 19th century. I'm not sure if what I'm saying is true, but it's a sense that I have in my little finger here that there is something of it. However, in 1839, the invention was read in the reverse order. There was, a, of course, an immediate uh, struggle or competition or uncomfortable feeling with how do we relate to painting from now on in 1839. But we are reading this the reverse order. We are moving back to a system of the tableau and moving away from the liberal system of anything can land on this surface which is vacant and is open to anything. This forces us to admit that all along during the entire existence of uh, analog photography, let's, uh, to use a cliche, let's just call it like that for a while, authenticity required confidence. And it would be a mistake to say that originality or the truth system was dependent on a material such as the polyester or the celluloid uh, or the lens or the apparatus of the camera. Um, but it was actually what it did. It developed a system or uh, an, an agreement, a collective agreement, that what would come out of this camera would be uh, part of a truth, of having been there, having been there somewhere, somewhere in time. And therefore, necessarily was familiar to anyone who would see it. So I continue saying that just like one would find reinsurance in the word of a member of one's own community, a mother or, of a, or a brother. With that I mean simply that um, the history of analog photography is a history of confidence, of being able to outsource truth to a device. And that in turn generated a speed of communication and a language which I think Gabor already referred to Willem Flusser, where Flusser um, beautifully explains this, the speed of the language of images as in relation to linear writing, where uh, image culture becomes the weapon of the proletariat or the non-literate uh, in um, gaining a language that would in the end outrun the speed of linear writing and would become the dominant system of all aspects of life, uh, including politics and uh, you name it. So in dark optics, the key word becomes confidence or the loss of confidence. And <clears throat> so fortunately, we are recording this talk, so maybe you have the chance of, you don't have to follow everything I say or understand, but there's a possibility to reread everything or to rerun uh, the con a conversation. The key word becomes confidence. And in dark optics, <coughs> we have to admit that confidence is gone. There is talk about um, this uh, new, I'm always surprised that there's, uh, people are actually uh, amazed by this. The, uh, it's called deep fake, I believe, where synthesized uh, combined images um, are being um, connected to a voice which is not the voice of a person. But you could imagine Barack Obama saying something of like, go fuck yourself. And he would have the end of a presidency um, announced because of that. So deep fake is uh, just one example of a many um, announcing a certain, a renewed, I would say, distrust in the camera and in the whole system, truth system, that the camera represents. However, I claim that maybe this truth system gets a few punches, but we can't really say goodbye to it. It's simply in our DNA nowadays to communicate through... Uh, that system of automated images which we call photographs and film and video, etc., for the fundamentalists among us. And slowly but certainly we find ourselves in a, in a comparison which is uncomfortable, is that we have to admit that perception 
perception cannot be outsourced to the camera, it cannot be outsourced to the photograph, um, that we still are always at risk of becoming mad when we have to, or when our confidence or our ideas of truth are being destroyed. This is what happens in trauma in a child that sees both parents deported and turns mad from one moment to the other. But there, we have to admit that actually madness or folly, um, uh, to say it with Michel Foucault, um, is part of perception and that there is always a thin line um, of uh, in which confidence may be gone and we find we have lost grip on the order of objects that surround us. Perception at that point becomes synonymous to panic. My claim is that collectively this is what's happening uh, to image culture, is that there is a lot of reinvestigation on um, is what we are seeing, does it have any does it have any any other meaning than what it wants to tell us? Um, slowly but certainly there's this sense that any image is a message directed specifically at someone and is not this um, liberal thing that has landed once upon a time in the lens of a camera and then hit, uh, hit the, dark, uh, the, uh, the body of the camera and was captured. The, the, the idea of capturing just goes away altogether. What we are talking about now is the idea of producing. And when we are producing, we are not only producing an image, we are producing a thought. So what remains is the panic. The confidence may be gone. We think we see, but we are of course unaware of seeing. And this is the definition of a fool, is that the fool will, uh, will suppose that everybody around him is observing the same uh, things he's seeing. So what we're left with is panic. Then I have a number of ideas which I, uh, there I wrote uh, remarks to be elaborated. Um, and I've actually already said the first one, the lens image can be credited for having established a lightning fast language of images that could outrun linear writing. The problem with linear writing was that it wrote history, but it wrote it very slowly. So the illiterate, in the end, won. And, uh, well, today images predict more or less uh, anything. And thus outrun the writing of history altogether. Photography continues to perform this task, albeit as a ritual. So the ritual continues to be practiced. Photography does not disappear, on the contrary, um, everyone became a photographer. Even after it has been swallowed back in by linear writing, and I know this is a difficult one, to be swallowed in by linear writing, but I suspect there is a competition between information and photography. It's a, a competition and I would say information, these are the old powers of the feudal powers that um, were uh, in, in, in power before the invention of photography, before this uh, incredible revolution that uh, signified photography, uh, which really was a system of checks and balances. Without photography, there would long have been a third world war and I, we probably wouldn't be sitting here. So it was that important. The alphabet is reformulated as a non-binary data string. I will not uh, go into that too much, first of all, because I haven't really figured out what I want to say with that. Uh, secondly, um, it, it will take another half an hour before we get anywhere. And then what digital does is it eats everything. This is probably the best definition that you can give on digital. To continue with the remarks on dark optics, <clears throat> there is another thing which is probably as complicated to talk about as the relation between the word and the image in dark optics, which is the role of Cartesian space in 3D uh, images. Just go back to analog photography. You have, what you have is a system of hope because you're always taking an image with light. 
as long as you have got light coming into your lens, uh, there is an image. So you always have, in fact, you have a device that is structurally is a hopeful thing. It is always uh, dependent on light. In dark optics, this is no longer the case. What you have are images which are produced out of coordinates. So we are speaking about uh, uh, Euclidean space, the three uh, axes out of which you need a position for uh, any line um, or any uh, uh, particle uh, to be defined in space. The worrying part of it is that this Cartesian space, which is, just imagine for a moment, the perspective which is at infinitum and ends, uh, let's say, in uh, probably in heavens or in a horizon which is unimaginable. So we have a clearly defined space and we have a coordinate somewhere in it and that is where um, the new image situates any subject it will depict. That means that even if you are in 3D space, you are entirely imprisoned. Everything is predetermined. Every image, although it may pretend to be liberated, like um, analog photography would have been, it is not. What it does, it emulates the same liberty, and we find ourselves with glasses, uh, 3D glasses, we look around us, and we have a sense of immersion into a space, but the space is completely predefined. The Cartesian space is something of which I've always had a, a profound distrust. Um, as it uh, implies the eye of God. And I think, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this is Gilles Deleuze that refers very beautifully, like only the French can, to the Cartesian space as le point de vue de deux. Sorry, I always make this mistake. Le point de vue de Dieu which is the cube and the view at infinitum, uh, the perspective point which then disappears into, uh, into an abyss of invisibility, which is the point of view of God. And it's changed into the binary system, which is le point de vue de deux. This is again something that you couldn't easily translate into another language, only the French can do it. When Deleuze speaks about le point de vue de deux, he speaks about um, the geometry of Leibniz and uh, the changes during uh, the Baroque uh, in the point de vue de Dieu that changes into the binary system which is now finally becoming the dominant system of computing. So what we have here is an opposition between the binary system and linear perspective. It resembles le point de vue de deux and le point de vue de Dieu. Don't try to understand everything, even I don't. Just soak it in for a moment. So that about the role of Cartesian space. Then the second uh, concept, if you are still awake, would be that of digital materiality, which is another paradox, because how can digital be referring to Materiality. It is, after all, everything is virtual. All you have are propositions made, again, you know, consensus, concept, and uh, what was the other one? You have all you have are propositions on which we agree, and out of that becomes comes an image. And this relates very specifically to my work. I will now start showing a few images. Just recently, and imagine I became 49 in order to realize that what I've been busy with all along was a search for materiality within the digital realm. The digital realm is this thing that eats everything. It will swallow everything and it will hide it on, an eye, on a cloud uh, or on a disk or anywhere where it can be uh, summoned back from from uh, the data and be crystallized into anything uh, or hidden. So there's always this discussion, is digital, has it, has it been developed in order to forget or in order to remember? I think we are far enough to realize that the two are still valid. It's both forgetting and remembering. Think about 
everything that's available uh, online. From my practice, and everything I say comes from my practice, by the way, um, I realized only recently that when I was attracted so much to working with natural phenomena, such as shadows or sunlight, or the passage of sunlight over landscape, and that includes also my preference for the, back the background and not so much the foreground in the film, I realized that these simple phenomena, just as, for example, water evaporating, crystallizing, that we find that objects around us and matter no longer present themselves in the analog state of permanence. They become objects that come into a continuous state of transition. And it is my belief that, uh, this is very naive language that I'm saying, in fact, that to stay with the, ma the matter of water, that water in a few generations from now will not be uh, what it used to be. That it will become something synthetic uh, in between um, a state of liquidity or evaporation not really in a natural manner, but in a synthetic manner. And this is a renewed formulation of all objects that surround us. This is something, a permanent state of see my dream, see my madness, which becomes a reality uh, in perception. So the new materiality of water is neither liquid, frozen, evaporated, but another substance that one can describe as synthetic, actively being read this way by our brain. I should add that it's not only our brain that is reading. Remember, I'm against uh, Cartesian space, but it's also, of course, our bodies. So I also don't think that we are talking about a perception that becomes matrix-like, where you take either the red or the blue pill, and you either see things the way they are or you don't. Forget all that. A few examples of work would be the oil workers of the Shell Company of Nigeria returning home, or even the Quiet Shore, which is an earlier work. But both works are back in time already quite a bit. This is a long title, The Oil Workers of the Shell Company of Nigeria Returning Home Caught in Torrential Rain, it refers to an image which I found on the internet of people, or one person taking a snapshot of people waiting for the rain to stop and for their journey to continue. I was fascinated with the inscription in the title that they would be oil workers of the Shell Company of Nigeria, and I realized very quickly that there was an awkward relation between the word oil, the Shell Company of Nigeria, and of course the omnipresence of water in the image. So I started out working uh, or doing research on this image and collecting imagery that was either oil or water, until I could no longer tell the difference. And from there, I made this piece which lasts about 10 minutes, and which is a slow elliptical travel, um, studying, in fact, the scene, but nothing is moving, everything is immobile. And the camera is uh, making a circular description until the water that you see in the image transforms over the minutes you look at it transforms over time, crucially over time, not immediately, into a third substance which is neither oil or water, but which is profoundly synthetic. The other piece, which is titled The Quiet Shore, which is a little bit older, uh, was made in the shore of Dinar, which overlooks uh, the, uh, uh, the city of Saint-Malo uh, in Brittany in France and has this um, rather unique feature that it has these extreme low tides and high tides. Um, I believe they're the most extreme in Europe. So you have this part of the shore which is never drying out, 
which is always uh, underwater and has this incredible silvery quality. When I saw this beach, I thought this is very strange because this really makes me think about the nature of photography and silver bromide and this precious material that's used in analog photography and all the chemicals, uh, the chemistry aspect that is in, uh, present in analog photography. So I imagined a, a world or a surrounding which would start to behave like a photograph. So what I did is I made a scene, basically invented everything like in the oil workers piece, uh, but just stabilized the sea up until the, the moment that the sea would be completely um, turning into ice or a mirror. Um, it's some kind of substance, uh, but it's very hard to decide which substance it is. But that, crucially, only changes as you keep on looking. It's not something that you can see in a moment in time, in an instant. It's something for which you need duration. And I haven't said yet that duration is my single biggest ally. It's... Um, it's the thing without which I could never work in photography. Uh, but it, it's also kind of a stranger to photography in a way. At the end of the film, which shows several hundreds of images of the same scene, which is a boy splashing into the water, and everybody around it, even from a long distance, seems to be interrogating this thing which is this event which is happening at the center of the scene which is this young boy splashing into the water now i have shown you only two images so you read this image naturally as water being splashed into but i can guarantee that the work which lasts a half an hour and if you sit it out after half an hour the splash no longer feels like a splash but it's a different kind of um, order of objects altogether. It's something which resembles more crystal or maybe glass, something semi-transparent, but which has turned into something fixed, not into, no longer into a liquid state. All this, I must admit, are never concepts that I uh, invent in advance. They always, they always just come to me. And I know usually only about them at the very end of the work. The third work, as an example on digital materiality, is the new piece, which is the first time I'm showing the images to anyone, which will be titled rather in a banal manner, The Confetti Piece, because it depicts thousands of confetti pieces falling down during a local election party in the United States which is an ultra slow motion piece. It's not actually made out of stills, but it's really at the edge of non-moving. And you have a crystal clear depiction of these, le of these, I would say, leaves or petals. They're rather semi-transparent uh, coming down. I think the work will be about transparency, weightlessness, all aspects of um, lightness and on the other hand heaviness weight um, or something that drags the objects down to the ground uh, but I'm not entirely sure we will know only when the work is finished and that should be exactly a week from now Again, it's a work with several hundreds of images that depict a single moment in time. The main character in the work is, once more, a young boy. Um, this time, it's a boy that is hiding away from the confetti. He's outputting a scream, uh, and it's a work without sound, so it's about a mute scream. And I if I'm not mistaken, the scream will be related to the heaviness. But we'll see about that.
How how am I with time? Fine. Okay. Still have a few minutes. Then I will continue to the last chapter. So we've spoken about dark optics, digital materiality, and I rem I realize I sound orthodox. Believe me, I'm not. I w I didn't speak to anybody about this until recently. Oh, I regret to say I continue a little bit more on digital materiality. Um, and I will just read it to you, virtual as digital materiality may be, but it does no longer imply that it does not alter our physical, psychological and biological being. I spoke about that. We may become radically incorporated into a new type of augmented situation or augmented perception. And there's an amusing a quote on Jean Baudrillard, which is, uh, I will not elaborate on him, but he's important for me for something else, which is radical incorporation, which belongs to, every, to all this, but um, which will lead us too far astray. I will not speak about that tonight. Uh, but Jean Baudrillard alluded to information, which he called 3D information. And he was himself an amateur photographer. He was not particularly good, but he was not particularly bad neither. And I'm glad he stuck to photography and not to painting, um, and which would have been awful given his uh, uh, intellectual status. And he referred to 3D information of the photograph as a cloud of information surrounding an image, which ultimately you don't need and becomes redundant as history progresses, but which is things like when has the picture been taken, what's the name of the people depicted, did they die or not, are they already dead or not, um, time, location, event, and other information to contextualize what we are seeing, but which claims Baudrillard is ultimately unimportant for it to be a good photograph. I don't like the last sentence very much. Because I think what's changing is that this 3D information slowly but certainly becomes very important for it to be a good photograph. I re regret it, but it is part of the new situation. And I give a small example, which is an artist uh, by the name of Taryn Simon. Some of you may have heard of her. I think she's very successful. And I saw an exhibition of her in uh, Tate Modern in London, if I'm not mistaken, and I observed the work, but then I observed the pattern of the spectators. And I realized that if I would draw a floor plan, the pattern of the spectators would be unlike any modernist approach to the visitor in a museum and the artwork, which would be liberated. It would have been a visitor who has no particular mission, except then to um, become unprogrammed. And I realized that the pattern of the visitor in the exhibition of Tarin Simon was very programmed. It was going from one leaflet, a four leaflet with information, to the next. The information was crucial and the viewing of the image was secondary. So you had groups of people pressing one another to read this A4 paper with Baudrillard's 3D information on it, and then they would verify that information with the image, and then would go on. That would make, that would produce a very amusing exhibition pattern, is that the visitors would go from one image to the next in this way, except ex in comparison to what we, I would call a liberate, liberated spectator who would go like that rather erratically and spend an undefined number of moments in front of each work or maybe none at all if it was of no interest. The following chapter is on radical incorporation and is about the renaissance of something that was last seen before the birth of photography. And that is of course the word linear writing and the command but I will not speak about that now. Instead, I will go on to a third idea um, 
I have just yesterday associated the anti-camera position to an, an anti which is very dear to me and which is anti-anthropocentrism. Another idea of which I only became aware recently, but which I can prove with all of my career from the very beginning. And um, works would be, for example, the Bordeaux piece from 2004, of which I will show some images, the Pure Necessity and Olympia, which is uh, one of the more recent works. Now, <clears throat> anti-anthropocentrism is also maybe anti-essentialism. It's being against the foreground. Being against the foreground as that which will narrate to you the more important parts of any history. And of course, the camera as a device is uh, a hunter-gatherer hunter eye par excellence. It's a, a gun, it shoots images, and it does actually uh, do something which is paradoxical to uh, any human, or in fact stranger to any human, it shoots images uh, from a distance. Um, it manages to be very hungry and to get to the bottom of an image very much faster than you could possibly ever pronounce or analyze. So we get this dichotomy between foreground and background the moment we have um, images appearing in, let's say, Western culture. That will probably be um, the narrowest definition we can have of it. Whether painting um, Flemish primitives uh, up until Hollywood and the Disney studios, etc., etc. We have a problem which is ongoing, but, or fascination, if you want, between foreground and background. And I realized uh, rather late in my career that my preference really is for those background pro uh, processes and that I am really against film because it drags everything into the light and it drags the processes to the foreground. It becomes all about it's actually an ally, ally of literature. While if you look back to the birth of the moving image, if you look back to the early uh, cinematographers, you will realize that, um, to quote the Lumiere brothers and their uh, famous little movie, Le Repas de Bébé, the, the breakfast of the baby, is that an early fascination of that image was not so much what the baby was having for breakfast, but was in the background the movement of the trees. And early on somebody brought my attention to that fact, you must have been influenced by, by that film. I had no idea, but later on I realized that effectively um, probably the romantic nature of my work wants that I rather have my gaze directed to those aspects of the image which are unimportant. And I find this back uh, in Gabor's work in a way, or that are considered of secondary importance and that are given a second chance by, uh, by the artist. The problem in the foreground, background uh, uh, dispute is, of course, the problem of speed. The hunter-gatherer eye requires that um, there is speed in perception. And it is in the nature of the moving image that there's a certain speed or violence to it. I will say violence, but I have to, uh, I have to make a certain nuance to that. It's a simple violence in the sense that uh, our eyes are unable to tell the difference between 25 images per second and uh, a natural animation. So we, we automatically accept this artificial image as natural. And that is a certain violence of speed. There is, a, uh, there is an aspect of the moving image which makes us, as viewers, incapacitated. We are unable, unable to relate with our own 
biology to that image. Which is why we are so much still under the spell of the image and the moving image altogether. With my love for the background and for everything that is unimportant, such as the landscape or the passage of time, of course also comes my concern for sleep. And uh, trying to regain the right to sleep in front of an image or a moving image, which is again another unwritten rule that you will not sleep in front of a moving image. You will be constantly fascinated with that movement which is happening right in front of your eyes. So moving image is linked to the idea of exhaustion and we have lost the right to sleep. Then a few more key words as to this uh, uh, anti-foreground uh, position that I have would be my use of duration or time. Duration, as you all know, is capital. So it is money, which means it is uh, financial assets. But of course, duration also is a biological reality, is that you, we don't have a lot of it. And the older we get, the less we have of it. So it is an asset of which we ever have less. So this is the problem with the whole discussion on duration always is that we actually don't know what we talk about. But we always talk about duration with a certain sense of nostalgia. It is impossible to speak on duration in a scientific manner. The only scientific manner we really have is uh, all related to clock time. But clock time itself is an illusion. As if you let me talk for another two hours, we will see. But we won't do that. I will end, I think, uh, how many minutes do I still have? I've had probably already 40 or so. You have to really stop me. Five, okay, great, perfect. Um, I will show some illustrations in, of three works um, on which this idea of the background is quite explicitly made, although I promise you I was unaware at when I started it. Uh, the first one to illustrate is a long title again. It's called Olympia, the real-time disintegration into ruins of the Berlin Olympic Stadium over the course of a thousand years. Now, you don't have to have a diploma in history to realize that there's a ref certain reference to the thousand years um, of Nazi Germany and of course the Berlin Olympic Stadium as an excellent uh, propaganda um, example of uh, German national socialistic thinking. And I knew the place quite uh, was quite familiar to the Olympic Stadium since I had been living in Berlin uh, but I'm no longer really living in Berlin so I went there on average once a year and I witnessed the building over the seasons and with different weather and at one point I realized that uh, in fact there's an unwritten rule of which no historian to my knowledge has written a lot, is that although the building seems to be explicitly elliptical and uh, disorientates uh, the viewer or the person who moves about in it, and that's done deliberately by the architect, or architects I should say, because several people worked on it. Um, in fact, the real subject matter of the building is light. Uh, also in the Nuremberg rallies, light becomes vertically uh, employed by uh, the big projectors of light which go straight into the sky and which uh, are a cheap way of making a moment in time look incredibly grand. Here there's a far more poetical um, use of natural light which I found rather disturbing because, of course, any reading of Nazi Germany should not imply the term 
poetics. And I found out at one point that um, in springtime, the last rays of light uh, fall onto one particular group of sculptures, which are not in this image, um, but which I think we will see a little bit later. Um, and I realized it did uh, profoundly move me. So I started thinking about a piece where I could take revenge on these um, uh, poetics of light because I somehow found it unjustified. And I started studying the building and I realized that the building is made in a really a militaristic way. The columns represent the stones, represent uh, the body of a soldier, I would say. And the soldier by himself or herself is nothing, but when encapsulated in the national body becomes immensely powerful. This is the rhetoric that the building speaks better than uh, many others. When this is affected by light, by natural light, this really becomes quite impressive. And you get uh, really the rhetoric of an army um, negotiated by light affecting and falling onto those stones. So what I set out to do was to reconstruct the whole thing digitally in virtual reality we will say but I scanned each stone separately and I put each stone into its geographically correct position as if I was the better German or the better Nazi and I was more precise than they ever would be and after that I set out to study with you know, I am very chaotic, so I can't do this myself, but with the help of, of other people, I set out to study the movement of light over the seasons of the year. And we calculated how uh, the seasons, uh, how this light looks like, and this is the blessing of a computer, of course, is that you can do this extremely precisely. And then we programmed... Um, well, we program, program a program uh, which runs in real time, year after year, season after season. Depending on the weather, we have sunlight or rain. So it is a real-time work. And each time you uh, show it in an exhibition, it is the actual weather in Berlin happening. So if it's snowing, it is snowing. If, if it's raining, it's raining. And it does that also in a very precise manner. So there was no more beautiful way than to show this for the first time in Berlin. And that was in January. And we had, magically, we had snow. This is one of the screenshots. So the reason why I have these screenshots is because there's a program running inside the program that takes photos. So it's the only memory I have of the work. Everything else like the previous image, you have the vegetation which keeps on growing and growing and growing. And here we come with the background, foreground dichotomy. My idea is that over the years, the vegetation will grow and grow and grow until it will, sorry, I go too fast, <laughs> until it will eclipse until it will eclipse the, uh, yeah, this will show you the schizophrenic nature of my work, uh, until the vegetation starts eclipsing the uh, building altogether. And the whole order of the building will collapse, not by it becoming a ruin over a thousand years, but by, by the vegetation that actually grows very fast. Except that we don't have time to observe vegetation growing very fast. This is too slow for our condition of images. And it's in this field that I operate. I work with the background, but I actually show something which is explicitly photographic and even more explicitly historical because it is the stadium in Berlin. Then we go back to the laughter, which is that piece, which actually... I made very much in coincidence with the Olympia Stadium, 
which is titled The Pure Necessity and which is a complete reconstruction of a well-known film, The Jungle Book, by the Disney Studios, itself referring, of course, to the Rudyard Kipling story about a young boy by the name of Mowgli living among wild animals and uh, in the end making his journey back to civilization. Now, this is probably the maddest idea I've ever had because I set out to redo the entire animation and I wanted it to be exactly one hour. One hour is a good definition of boredom or time passing, isn't it? It's clock time. Uh, but I didn't make it. It became 56 minutes because it was simply too expensive and too elaborate to... Um, to do, but we managed to get almost one hour. And what happens is that um, when you see the animation, all conversation and all dialogues, all dancing and all the rhythmical aspects of the original animation are gone. You have basically animals living in an animal park or in a zoo, uh, being bored to death and moving around in the same backdrops as the Jungle Book quite in the same chronological manner as the film evolves, but without any of the messages of, um, of, uh, the jungle, of the Disney animation. As you keep looking, there's a strange split between the foreground and the background. The foreground quite quickly loses its importance because you can't really connect to animals that waste their time. Um, drink a little bit take a shit and uh, do other things which are what biological bodies would do. Uh, but the real biological body, in fact, becomes the background, which is this rather unimportant vegetation on the background. In fact, this idea of being against the foreground and against the anti, or I mean the anti-human uh, or the anti-anthropos, comes from the realization in working in this work that in fact there was very little vegetation to be seen in, in, the, in, in uh, the Jungle Book animation, the 1967 version. Probably because the foreground had been very expensive to make. The film had been incredibly expensive, the most expensive animation up to that date. And there were savings to be done in the background. So there was really um, a bit of work in cutting um, the diversity of the vegetation. And I thought this was quite amusing because in dark optics you have precisely this going on. You have a reduction in biodiversity of all objects that surround us because you need consensus. And in order to have consensus, you need to have compromise. In order to have compromise, you have shortcuts. So what you have is a reduced version of the surrounding world. It's not a very good idea to bring your children to this work. Although it was originally conceived for a children's hospital, um, but it didn't happen, fortunately. The third work, the last work, and after that I will stop, is titled The Bordeaux Piece. It dates from 2004. And it's a single channel work, it's a simple work, simple, single, simple installation, but it, it's over headphones and speakers. In the headphones we have a story, and in the speakers we have uh, the sounds of the background, the birds, the traffic noise, uh, a passing sco uh, scooter or, or somebody uh, accidentally walking into the image, etc., etc. It's a, a story of 10 minutes, but there are 75 films of 10 minutes. It's not a single film that loops, but you are led to believe that it is a single film that loops. So, when I started thinking about this work, and you, you, you have, by now, you have felt that I love exhaustive work, which um, uh, I will hate at the end, which I always do, or glad to have it over with, 
because I believe that labor and in intensity uh, in the end will kind of permeate uh, even through the slowness and boredom of, uh, the, uh, which are apparent in the work. So we have 75 short films, which are not very, is not a particularly interesting story. It's a story about an older man, his son, and then the girlfriend of the son, and what happens. The older man, who's the wealthy uh, film tycoon, he picks in the girlfriend of his son. But uh, his son discovers this and is slightly upset, but can't do anything about it. Uh, he confronts his father with this, but because he's the son and the father is all powerful, he's not really able uh, to bring this conversation or this confrontation to a good end. After 10 minutes, the story ends and the father goes off to his um, on, on his plane uh, to Berlin where he will have an important meeting. The narrative is lightly based on uh, Jean-Luc Godard's Le Mépris, but really only lightly. I had mentioned it rather en passant to the senior actor who is Josse de Pau, a very good Belgian uh, theatre maker and actor, who helped me with writing the story. And we came up with this narrative that can repeat on and on and on and on. So what we did is we didn't actually make 75 films of 10 minutes in real time. What we did is we divided the film into chapters. The opening of the film, the unfolding of the story with the girl, he seduces the girl, the son discovers it, the son confronts his father with it, and then the father says, go to hell, I'm going off to Berlin, and then that's the end of it. So these were clear chapters. There were lo rather long takes, which has had as a main uh, objective to show as much as possible of the quality of the light in the backdrop. And the location is in the south of France, uh, southeast of France, uh, overlooking Bordeaux. The house is owned by somebody who, who owns a, a, a very well-known modern villa, or contemporary villa, I would say, postmodern villa. And it is all about examining this, uh, the qualities of the, 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 the light passing over the course of a summer day. So we started very early in the morning at sunrise, and we ended at sunset. The beauty was that at sunset, we put on all the lights and then the whole film crew is revealed. That's the last shot. But nobody ever in a museum gets to see those films, the early ones and the late ones, because, of course, the museum is closed. So there you go again with the love of the background in a rather radical way. If I had more time, I would show you uh, amusing uh, montage which I have made of the main actor performing his first sentence, and he does it 75 times. I made a collage of each first sentence, and you can feel him getting more exhausted over as the day passes. And by the end of the day, he starts making mistakes. And in the end, he says, oh, what the fuck, you know, I forgot my line. And this is all part of the camera. Um, so all accidents, uh, everything that could happen, happened, and it was all registered. The only real important thing is that the sun was shining and that we would have the passage of the shadows over the scene. So you can, get where, you can guess where I got my cheese. Uh, the building was all about this um, quality of light in, in the southern French light. And uh, this is what I uh, picked up as an idea. But it's pretty old work, it dates back to 2004. But one of my very first works has as a subject matter, has a tree. So a tree is a topic that, or a motif that uh, came back again and again and again. I don't know if I have given you any uh, contribution to the anti-camera, but very indirectly, I believe, I hope I did, um, and I will stop here.
Thank you. The first part of, of David le David's lecture, I also got panic in that sense that what will happen with us now? And uh, following the lines, I came to the solution that uh, there is one thing what we can rely on, as, or I was thinking, that there is one thing what we can rely on as truth is the personal experience. And from that point of view, I, as time was passing by, I was still thinking that maybe I, could, I would ask from both of you what David also mentioned in one of his lectures. What is the difference between the image what we are constructing in our mind related to the experiences? And there are other images which are constructed by the media. Um, this will be the question. But uh, as time was passing by, I came to the solution that I still have to keep my panic because what I also experience with the young generation is that step by step, they are more and more, they have more and more hunger to different experiences what the new media is offering to them because they want to cheat their own life experience to have something which is more what they can experience. So, maybe the result with, with being a couple of years, maybe, that people will be bored of what they see here because that will be not enough and they would like to have something more. But maybe we were running too, too far. So my question is, The rescue line is still what we can keep in our mind, how we see the reality, or it was just, um, uh, or it still is just an intermediate moment. I know that Gabor is very critical about the future of technologies, as we were discussing yesterday, and um, and maybe David is David is more positive about that, but I don't know if what we have seen behind the lines. Is it real that you are positive in the direction and you are negative in it, or something vice versa? Maybe I was asking too much. The image, negative yeah. and positive, right? <laughs> but um, no, I don't know. Do you have something in your mind that you want to say right away? <laughs> and not more urgent than you have. So. <laughs> Go ahead. I wouldn't have it either. So uh, anyway, um, uh, what was the question? <laughs> so it was um, on the positive or the negative uh, yeah but, the, but it was something like that uh, the mind image related to the to sense the, of the reality of the sense of the reality I don't know it's hmm? yeah 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 I know because that's in some sense it's interesting uh, question, uh, especially if uh, if we uh, would, would combine it with the uh, media problematic, well, yeah. which is which is a uh, yeah. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, I have to go like that. <laughs> um, I think it, it, um, the interesting part of uh, this unease about um, whether uh, whether we are in, uh, part of a program um, and whether we can have any confidence in uh, what we can see around us I think I see you know both positive and negative I wouldn't you know although I m might sound paranoia when I refer to the madman uh, but actually the thing about it is that the truth system collapses. And the good thing about this is that it makes us realize that all along there was no um, truth in the automated image. And if the collective unconscious is nervous about it, I think it's a rather 
it's a rather good thing. And I would say these young kids are probably will have the intelligence to question in how far they are being targeted by the by an image, um, and will develop no doubt a new intelligence in how to relate to um, photographic image in the future, which will become, you know, a clone of a photographic image, will be, which will pretend to be something. And we will have to continuously exam examine that pretension. That, I think, is true. Um, so, I, just as I was referring to this new materiality of the digital, it also probably requires that we develop a new intelligence on um, on the new photography, so to speak. If you would say so, new intelligence, that I think it's the most important thing is that reality will no one give a shit anymore. That's the main thing that it's a, a, a most uh, relevant part of the fact that that, uh, that uh, everybody knows what that reality means. Mm -hmm. But it's not that we want to refer or we wanted to search back that again and again in the image itself because mm -hmm. we we know that it can be created and the, and the, and what it's in the mind it's as a created image exists it's sometimes the most strongest mind is mm -hmm. just remember about the dreams what it happens mm -hmm. uh, in an unconscious uh, sense of the brain which can provide you the most vivid images of uh, life and existed reality, which is in fact, it's, it's just purely uh, uh, imagined. But I think the, 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 the chilly part of it is that uh, maybe people will not, no longer give a shit of what, sorry, my French, for what the what it will be or what the image will be like. But I think the chilly part is that they never gave a shit <laughs> to start with. It's just that it, it um, as a religion, it would have appeared that we gave to the automated, automated image, namely the photographic image, that we gave this confidence to it. And now it appears that all along, um, wasn't really part of a system, of a reality building system. And, um, I, well, that's a healthy, uh, it's a health, healthy uh, realization to make. You know? um, what brings us back to is that I think, um, or the risk maybe, is that we start seeing that which currently governs um, the social and political system, namely images, um, that uh, if we don't if we don't care, we have to say. But it nevertheless has incredible uh, uh, consequences. Yeah? It has incredible impact. Uh, unlike linear history or linear writing, it does have the capacity nowadays to change. Uh, laws, uh, moods, behaviors, uh, or even uh, generate revolutions. Yeah? This is uh, the speed of images. So it's not that innocent. Uh, it's not that not innocent. It's not that harmless. Um, but there has to be a new kind of play um, in relation to uh, the image that's being produced. And that's a novelty. Um, it's, we're back at the tableau, we're basically back at painting, we're back at those in power in the 19th century, one could say, before photography. Um, um, but it's not without, it's not without risk. Um, and, um, well, I'm doing all the monologuing. No, but it's uh, what you have been just mentioning about the... Uh, that uh, we give the credit to the... Uh, uh, analog uh, images to mm -hmm. to represent uh, the reality, 
But uh, we, as we have been talking about it yesterday, uh, also over the work of Tassitadin, mm -hmm. that it's uh, the, the fact what she refers to, that it, uh, uh, the analog image is somehow that some kind of rip imprint of uh, what we what we consider to be the, the reality. Having happened. Yes, yeah, she referred in, that was a reference she made when I tried to deconstruct her argument, was a reference she made to, she said, when I take my camera and I, uh, I, I, I film the sun, then I know that even in the fifth generation copy of, or so many generation copy of that film, it is still a trace of the original sun. And I tried to deconstruct that in saying that, in fact, that's really only true purely conceptually, purely theoretically. Um, that sun has underwent a lot of transformation in between. Um, and, but what we do permanently, which is very weird, is we outsource always truth to a device. And I think that marks uh, the history of the image altogether is that you outsource truth to a device, whether it is a panel painting in the 15th century, um, which by the way always goes a little bit faster than we can, so it impresses us for a while, but then it ceases to do so and it changes again until the next stage of immersion or nearness is found. Um, oh, I forgot for a moment why I do this. Oh yeah, because so indeed and I think that really the chance of um, losing the religion of, uh, uh, of photography is that um, we realize that actually we shouldn't outsource truth to a device. Mm. That all along what we do is actually a mirror but system. But isn't that what happens uh, since, uh, I mean, because photography was the first thing which was a me me mechanical Mm -hmm. way of making image mm -hmm. uh, without interfering with the uh, 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 existing yeah, of that's image. the passion isn't it yes. is to, to have no interference or as li little as possible yeah. to not have human creation uh, in interfering into the image and I think the good news is that and that was sorry but that was all of the thing but uh, if you're talking about uh, what I was trying to mention this uh, duality of the subject mm -hmm. and the uh, and uh, uh, matter or, and with the uh, image that it's um, <clears throat> uh, we believe so that all that names or, or, or in the in the technical apparatus itself which is relates to the objective mm -hmm. the um, <clears throat> non-human uh, attaching uh, facts relates us to that fact that probably has got more to do with reality because it's not uh, infected by the human. Absolutely. Very early after the invention or, or development of photography, you have, uh, you have mise en scène in the first four years, I believe it is. Um, but what you're saying, I, I think, is actually an interesting example of outsourcing to the device. Well, actually, the good news is that we realize now that we actually only have our own biological reference. The way we breathe, the time we spend, um, the hurry in which we are in, that these become the new reference and we, can't no we, we can no longer outsource it to the device. So the device becomes actually a playful thing. It becomes a, a thing of truth, manipulation, uh, fake, uh, but as you, as you pick it, as you choose it, and, but it actually it takes away 
this uh, 160 years illusion, <laughs> which uh, was so necessary yeah. somehow. I think there's always, whenever we speak of an image, there's always two aspects present, and without it you, you can't have an image, is that you have uh, what I would describe as malleable surface. You have surface that can be manipulated. It can be used in one way or another. Um, and the other, it would, they would seem never, they, would, they don't seem to belong together, but they're nevertheless the condition for an image, is uh, unmediated presence. So uh, the sense of nearness, I would say immersion, I, for a long time I spoke about immersion, but immersion is actually um, being drunk, isn't it? Uh, nearness is uh, presence, being very close to the skin. Um, and of course the per perplexion that follows out of the combination of the two. Is that, you can have, that you can have a malleable surface uh, that can bring you closer than you've ever been. Um, uh, well, yeah. I think it's that uh, it's still important in the sense that uh, we mentioned the digital and analog as a as a different aspect. It's a sense of that um, uh, although analog has introduced the technology to to image making, the digital, which has went uh, further on that road. And that means that, um, um, which is again a thing which we have been talking about, but it hasn't been added to this discussion or talking today, that it's the, um, the ex acceleration concept of the mm -hmm. whole theory, which means that things are speeding up and, and while we are continuously uh, looking at uh, images, and deciding on um, 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 to throw them away or or to put them in the archive. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we are uh, we, we we are capability of reading faster and faster mm -hmm. to be able to decide uh, and making the right decisions of the technology. Uh, I'm afraid that it's the end. The thing is that, that it takes it over and the decision is not in, not in our hand any longer to make the, the, the image existing in a sense as we, as we are imagined. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the audience can imagine how our night will go on after this, this talk. You can imagine what will happen from now. Heavy drinking. <laughs> Heavy drinking, yes. <laughs> so I would like to thank you for your patience and, and attention and, uh, and uh, energy to the last three hours. 
And um, this is the point where we let you go. Thank you very much. <laughs>